Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Your stool is ready for you. We've got good, bad, and crazy martinis. And we'll also take a look back at the political career of former Vice President Walter Mondale, who passed away yesterday. That'll be towards the end of our discussion today. Jim, let's start with the good, which is a takeoff on our discussion yesterday of California Congresswoman Maxine Waters going to Minnesota, even before closing arguments for some reason, uh, to explain that if it's not guilty, guilty, guilty on murder, uh, then they got to stay in the streets and get even more confrontational. Well, yesterday, the defense attorney for Derek Chauvin, the police officer who was seen on the viral video you know, kneeling on George Floyd around Memorial Day of last year, said, look, these jurors are not sequestered. They're not supposed to look at media, but uh, given the way things are right now with news alerts and phones and stuff, I don't know how they can avoid comments like this from Maxine Waters, the judge ultimately denying that motion for a mistrial because of things like that, but he did have a lot to say. This is Judge Cahill, the presiding judge in the case, about politicians like Maxine Waters saying really stupid things like she said. Here's what he had to say. I wish elected officials would stop talking about this case, especially in a manner that is disrespectful to the rule of law and to the judicial branch and our function. I think if they want to give their opinions, they should do so in a respectful and in a manner that is consistent with their oath to the Constitution to respect a co-equal branch of government. Their failure to do so, I think, is abhorrent, but I don't think it has prejudiced us with additional uh, material that would prejudice this jury. They have been told not to watch the news. I trust they are following those instructions and that there is not in any way uh, a prejudice to the defendant beyond the articles that we're talking specifically about the facts of this case. A congresswoman's opinion really doesn't matter a whole lot. Anyway, so motion for mistrial is denied. So, Jim, good on the judge. I think he's probably right that you can't necessarily declare a mistrial on this. Uh, I I am a little bit surprised that this jury was not uh, sequestered, uh, particularly since the Brooklyn Center shootings. But uh, what's done is done. He also said that uh, the defense may have grounds uh, for an appeal as a result uh, to have everything thrown out. His words, uh, if in fact uh, there is a conviction in this case. So uh, we talked about how irresponsible and reckless Maxine Waters was uh, in those comments. You talk about it today in the morning jolt as well. So good on the judge for smacking her down and anybody else who wants to act stupidly right now. Yeah. And look, like one of the things that uh, I try to lay out in the morning jolt is that most, I assume most listeners are pretty familiar with her. She's been around Congress for a long time. First elected 1990. She was in California state legislature in like, I want to say 1976. Um, She's one of the few people who can look at Joe Biden and say he's a rookie. (laughs) <laughs> um, so this is someone and also worth noting is that look she's obviously representing um, a portion of Los Angeles that is heavily African American although I think less African American than it used to be I think it's growing more Latino very heavily Democratic not only has she never had a competitive race usually she's winning I think the lowest was ever was just short of 71% for a lot of years she was winning the general election with 80% or more and uh, she's never really had a serious primary challenge either, which is a little bit surprising in all of that time. She is effectively uh, politically untouchable. And I don't think that brings necessarily brings out the best in people. I don't think that brings out a, that there's a certain sense of lack of accountability. Um, and that I guess one of the things, like you can be angry at Maxine Waters. I think you should be angry at Maxine Waters. This was a particularly... Uh, not just incendiary, but as you said, stupid, damaging, and and really just about the worst thing you could say in this set of circumstances. But I think part, like one of the observations is that it Maxine Waters must be shocked right now, not just by this rebuke from this judge. It was kind of interesting. I had said that there really hadn't been any serious rebuke from any other Democrats over what she said. Apparently, a Fox News producer says that there are Democrats who are off the record really grumbling about this, think she's really put the Democrats on the hook for any rioting. If, God forbid, there are uh, there are riots up in Minnesota. I'll believe that when I start seeing it on the record. I, I find it very plausible. It wouldn't surprise me if that was the case, but I don't give anybody credit for being off the record, very upset with a colleague, but then refusing to say anything publicly. Um but so, I mean, why would Maxine Waters think that her words would have this consequence in this situation? 
There's never been any consequence for anything she's ever said. There's never been anything where somebody, certainly on her side, has come out and said, whoa, 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 Congresswoman Waters, you shouldn't say that. That's out of line. That's going too far. And this comes, I mean, you know, I, I, would, I think one of the things that jumped out at me the most as I went back into the deep, thick Maxine Waters controversy file. 1992, uh, she was endorsed Bill Clinton. That's not surprising at all. But she said that George H.W. Bush was a racist for many, many reasons. Quote, he is a mean-spirited man who has no care or concern about what happens to the African-American community in this country. I truly believe that, end quote. Now, Greg, I'm not saying George H.W. Bush was a perfect president. Uh, I do think he's one of those presidents whose qualities do get uh, more appreciated over time. You don't realize how good you have it until it go until it's gone. And even if you're angry at him about raising taxes or breaking his promise not to raise taxes, even if for some reason you were upset about the Persian Gulf War, or even if you thought that the unemployment going all the way up to 6% in 1992 <laughs> represented a terrible recession. Oh my goodness. You know, it looks very mild compared to the, the great recession we experienced later. Um, I don't think you can say George H.W. Bush was a mean-spirited man. I don't think you can fairly say he had no care or concern about what happens to the African-American community. You might argue he's out of touch. You might argue that being in Washington, he did not have um, the most up-to-date or, or kind of you know, tuned-in sense of what the African-American experience was in that time. But I don't think you could say he's a racist man. I don't think you know, Obliviousness is not malevolence. And there's a lot of blurring of the lines there. And I don't even know if I could necessarily call George H.W. But the fact that she could harness this much furious denunciation over George H.W. Bush was kind of an indication of who Maxine Waters has been her entire time in Congress. And of course, obviously, she called on people to confront uh, Trump cabinet members. And uh, uh, the other thing, which I the quote that jumped out at me, I can't believe didn't get more uh, attention at the time. Just last year, she said, I've worked with gangs, I've worked with Crips, I've worked with Bloods, and there's more integrity in many of these young people in the hood than this man has, referring to President Donald Trump. Look, I got a lot of criticisms of Donald Trump, but I don't think you can look at him and Bloods and Crips and say, oh yeah, the Bloods and the Crips are the good guys, or the Bloods and the Crips are more morally superior. Maybe there's some like reformed gang member who's turned his life around and turned into a role model for the community that you can positively compare, but uh, I don't think that's the case, and I think that... Um, I mean, Maxine Waters has been playing this role uh, going back. You go back to the 1992 LA riots. You know, she was, you know, very, you know, getting her to denounce the rioters was like pulling teeth. And she constantly kept saying, oh, no, this was really, it was mothers stealing diapers for their children and, and other lines like that. So this is who she is. But for the first time, there's this sense of like, oh, wait, you might cause a mistrial. Your implied threat to the jurors is going to make any guilty verdict, you know, now create a question of, was it because they genuinely thought he was guilty or because they were afraid of riots and they were afraid Maxine Waters was going to stir people up and say, okay, now it's time to start torching storefronts and stuff like that. I don't know what's going to shake out here in, in Minneapolis, but I think this is a long overdue consequence and an important lesson for everybody in politics. We've got a really long stretch where anybody could say anything and enjoy the media attention and enjoy the donations and enjoy all the clicks and enjoy all, this, all, the, all the upside. Hey, you know what? Sometimes there's a downside and I can't help but notice a whole bunch of the people who are being very quiet about Maxine Waters were furious about what Donald Trump said on January 6th at that rally on the ellipse. Now, we had a big debate about whether Donald Trump was morally or legally culpable for what happened in the Capitol Hill riot. But I don't really understand how you can say Donald Trump is, you know, uh, uh, the absolute worst in the world for what he said on that day and say, oh, there's no big deal with about Maxine Waters and vice versa. I don't think you can give Maxine, denounce Maxine Waters and say that, well, you know, Donald Trump really did rile up that crowd and then he sent them in the direction of, of Capitol Hill. What did he expect was going to happen? So anyway, all in all, it's just glad to see a judge come out and call out outrageous behavior on the part of a congresswoman. And hopefully this will be kind of a, a, a lesson for policymakers in the future that, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. And I don't think Maxine Waters has been responsible in this situation at all.
No, and she hasn't for a long time. You mentioned those 1992 comments about the first President Bush, and that just reminds me of how every four years, the greatest threat to our nation is whoever the Republican nominee is. The same thing happened with Bush uh, Jr., but George W. Bush, even John McCain, who was the media darling, except for those few months he was the nominee. Uh, Mitt Romney, of course, was the torturer of dogs and put women in binders. And then obviously Trump and then, uh, you know, whoever's next uh, exactly treated the same way. I remember watching ESPN did an excellent uh, documentary on the OJ trial, and they started by going way back to racial unrest in the 70s. And there was a clip of Max seen waters even then uh talking out uh in, in ways that were probably not very helpful and so i was just thinking man she has been at this a very long time and you'd think by now she'd be a lot smarter about what she'd say in these situations but apparently not all right well let's talk about a brand new sponsor here at the three martini lunch trust and will Look, nobody likes to think about making plans for their own passing, but uh, as Ben Franklin told us many, many years ago, there are only two certainties in life, death and taxes. We've been talking about taxes plenty lately, but obviously death is, is another one. And so while it may be unpleasant, you can't put it off forever. And the sooner you get it done, the more peace of mind you'll have that your family is taken care of and they won't have to do a bunch of guesswork about how you wished you would have distributed your assets and uh, other uh, made other decisions about your your medical care if you can't uh, uh, respond for yourself and that sort of thing. So that's where Will and Trust comes in because at willandtrust.com, setting up an estate plan is simple, convenient, and secure. For as little as $39, you can nominate guardians for your children, determine who gets your stuff, and plan for future medical care all from the comfort of your home. Hiring a traditional estate attorney can cost thousands of dollars, and using a one-size-fits-all template is not nearly specialized enough for you. Trust and will documents are designed by estate planning experts and customized for the state you live in. And with live customer support seven days a week, trustandwill.com's team is available to answer any questions you have while setting up your plan. I can't tell you about the peace of mind that uh, my wife and I have of having done this. We did it many, many years ago after our uh, second child was born. I come from a family of financial planners and investment experts. And so as soon as as soon as we were in that stage of life, they said, you've got to get this done. And so we did. But I'll tell you what, we paid a lot more than uh, we would have done with Will and Trust. And I've, I've gone to their website. They start with some very basic questions. Are you married? Do you have guardians in mind if your, your children are still minors when you happen to pass? And uh, how would you like to uh, distribute your assets? And then they go into more and more detail from there. So Trust and Will is the most trusted name in online estate planning, the category leader on Trustpilot, and they've helped hundreds of thousands of people protect their families, assets, and legacy. So gain that peace of mind at trustandwill.com slash martini and get 10% off plus free shipping of your customized legal documents. Don't wait. Go right now. This is really important. Get 10% off plus free shipping at trustandwill.com slash martini, trustandwill.com slash martini. All right, Jim, staying in Minneapolis for the moment. Uh, yesterday were the closing arguments, and then we had the the argument over Maxine Waters, which, as uh, we already said, the judge said uh, he denied the motion for a mistrial. So the jury is now deliberating. We don't know when there will be a verdict. I would assume it'll be sometime this week, but uh, you never know for sure. Uh, and so as we turn to the focus being on the jury, CBS News, among others, uh, focusing on on the jurors, and this clip yesterday got universal denunciation from all sides uh, when it came to this trial. This is reporter Jamie Yukis in Minneapolis uh, referring to the fact that one of the jurors lives in Brooklyn Center, and she went into other personal detail about jurors as well. From those statements that they provided the court, there's at least one juror who lives in Brooklyn Center, near where Dante Wright hmm. was shot and killed by police just last week. And we know that there are a few other jurors, according to Eric Nelson, uh, who wanted this wanted the jury sequestered immediately when that shooting happened in Brooklyn Center, is that there are at least two or three other jurors who have connections to Brooklyn Center. Of course, Brooklyn Center just on the edge of the city of Minneapolis, an inner ring suburb. So a lot of people do live there and commute into the city to work. Uh, so they would have ties potentially to that area, even if they don't live there. There's not a lot that's still private in our society right now, but there's not much, I would say, that needs to be kept private more than jurors. If we are going to have a system that is remotely impartial and free from outside influence, we have got to protect this aspect of our system. And between uh, 
some of the judges' decisions, I believe, here in not uh, protecting the jury, and then the media doing this stuff in anticipation of a verdict. It's so irresponsible. Yeah. I mean, the first thing that kind of comes to mind is, I think it was yesterday during the argument and spurred the, the, F, you know, the motion for a mistrial, um, there had been the observation that one of the jurors lived in the community. They've been hard hit by the riots recently. And uh, I think the judge said it was an alternate juror and someone they'd already dismissed. So that was less of an issue. Um, look, do, are there times where the public may have an interest in certain characteristics of the jury? Sure. I think we've seen in the past, I think practically, you know, the, the number of times that you've had an all white jury that may or may not give a, uh, uh, a fair trial to an African-American defendant. Okay. I could see that. Do you know, would you want an all male or all female jury on a, uh, on a, on a rape case or, or something like that? Is there some reason to think that the jury was kind of an unusually uniform characteristics that would inhibit uh, some aspect of getting a fair trial. Uh, that said, you know, keep in mind that both the prosecution and the defense attorney gets an opportunity to reject certain numbers of people. And so this is the jury that both sides agreed to. If they wanted to object, they either, you know, they had the opportunity or they ran out of those opportunities. Usually get only get a certain number of times you can object to a particular juror. Um, but as for the CBS disclosure of these characteristics of them, look, what do they think is gonna happen? Right. I mean, we, we know just how charged this emotionally charged this trial is. We know what has happened so far and we know what has happened in the past um, in terms of, of rioting and violence. And let me just say, go back and, and you, you mentioned the, uh, the O.J. Simpson uh, documentary ESPN did a few years ago. It had a fascinating aspect on something that happened about, an, oh, about a year before the, the infamous Los Angeles riots and Rodney King. It was a... Uh, young African-American teenager, teenage girl who went into a convenience store, um, picked up some orange juice, was accused of shoplifting. She says she wasn't shoplifting. She was going to pay for it. Got into an argument with the, uh, the older Korean American woman who was behind the counter and the older Korean American woman shot her in the head. Just it, it's on video. It's horrifying to watch the young teen turns around. She just takes out the gun, just ex- executes her right there. So you go for a trial and it's, you know, because it's on videotape, it's not like there's that much dispute. She's found guilty, but in this case, it was not a jury. It was a judge and the judge sentenced the Korean American shopkeeper to community service, no jail time. And that was like the, there was an immediate like outburst. And, and I believe, I wouldn't say it was, you know, I don't know if it actually described it as a riot, but like angry family members and friends and members of the African-American community trying to pound down the doors of the courtroom, right? Um, momentary chaos. And eventually the bailiffs came in and managed to, to, you know, get that. Like, you look at that. I can't ever justify rioting. I can't justify looting. I cannot justify trying to burn down somebody's store. But man, I can understand that outrage. I can understand that outrage if somebody says, this person has been dead. We, the state, we, the criminal justice system, have determined that the proper consequence for murdering someone in cold blood, just holding the gun right up to their head and pulling the trigger, is community service. I mean, you know, what I'm saying is that out, there are circumstances in which outrage is justified, but the moment you start expressing that outrage in a way that starts uh, you know, in, 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 uh, harming other people or infringing upon the rights of other people, the property of other people, well, now you've lost the moral high ground. Now you're just another criminal. Um, but this is all the circumstances is going on. What does CBS think is going to happen when the members of the jury find out that their, you know, that not their specific identities, but a whole bunch of their characteristics have been put out there. And it'd be an interesting question of whether at some point, the, you know, d- does that information get out there? If you know that it, it's almost like the, um, if you ever watched the, the John Adams miniseries, it was on HBO. Back then they didn't have it. There's, everybody could see who the jurors were and everybody knew who the jurors were. Well, I don't know that we want, you know, jurors to wear masks in a non-COVID setting or keep them shielded from the public so that nobody can get a good look at their faces, but a sense of like, look, we, we saw this in Capone trials, right? In organized crime trials. If people can intimidate jurors, they will do that. And in a strange way, revealing this much information about the jurors in the press in such an emotionally charged situation does feel like a form of jury intimidation and is egregious judgment on the part of CBS News. No, I think that's right. I think you're right also about the fact that basic information can be out there. I mean, we've heard for years, oh, the 
eight woman, four man jury will now deliberate. OK, I mean, that does not give away anything. You can you could say even the racial breakdown. But once you start talking about where people live, yeah, their home address and their kids go to this preschool, you know, <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, this didn't get, get quite to the point of specific doxing, but uh, creeping right up to-, to the line. Yeah, yeah, it's creeping in that direction. And we need to hit the reverse button real quick. All right. Well, let's talk about something much happier than that. And that is the comfort you will find with the new My Slippers. They're from My Pillow. We've talked about the towels and the sheets and so many other things, but the My Slippers, they spent two years on these things to make sure they're the highest in quality and comfort. And I must say, success 40% off right now for all three Martini Lunch listeners with the promo code Martini at MyPillow.com. My Slippers are durable and meant to be worn all day, indoors, outdoors. They have beautiful leather suede, Cozy faux fur linings. They have moccasin or slip on style. They're available in a variety of colors and they come with a 60 day money back guarantee or a one year limited warranty. There's a three tier cushioning system starting with the My Pillow patented fill. Yeah, the same stuff that's in the pillows. Then the Comfort Memory Foam and finally the patented Impact Gel. And on the front of the feet, heels too. So soft and comfortable. Love these things. For a limited time, uh, My Pillow offering 40% off the new My Slippers. Go to mypillow.com and click on the radio listener's square, enter the promo code Martini or call 800 874 0104. While you're there, take advantage of the deep discounts on all the My Pillow products including the Giza Dream bed sheets. The My Pillow mattress topper and the My Pillow towel sets. You can only save that 40% on the new My Slippers though with the promo code Martini. So use it calling 800-874-0104 or visit mypillow.com today. All right, Jim. Those were two difficult martinis to start off with, so uh, let's go to our crazy, which is uh awkward. In fact, if you have little kids, you might want to hit pause right now, but uh New York Post You know, we've heard, Jim, that love is love, and we've seen a lot of change on the, um, I I don't know what you would even call this, uh, sexual revolution uh, front in the last few years, but uh, here's what it says. A New Yorker who wants to marry their own adult offspring is suing to overturn laws barring the incestuous practice, calling it a matter of individual autonomy. The pining parent seeks to remain anonymous because their request is, quote, an action that is a large segment of society views as morally, socially, and biologically repugnant. Mm-hmm. According to court papers, through the enduring bond of marriage, two persons, whatever relationship they might otherwise have with one another, can find a greater level of expression, intimacy, and spirituality, the parent argues, in the Manhattan federal court claim filed April 1st. Make make note of that. I hope I hope it's just an April Fool's joke, but something tells me it's not. Uh, legal papers give only the barest picture of the would-be newlyweds failing to identify their gender, ages, hometowns, or the nature of their relationship. Well, I think we can guess on the nature of their relationship. The proposed spouses are adults. The proposed spouses are biological parent and child. The proposed spouses are unable to procreate together. I'm sorry if you're eating lunch or about to. Incest is a third-degree felony under New York law, punishable by up to four years behind bars, and incestuous marriages are considered void, with the spouses facing a fine and up to six months in jail. And so uh, one of the um, the Manhattan family and matrimonial law attorney is uh, quoted in this uh, story saying, it's never going to fly. The closest you can come is Woody Allen. That wasn't his biological daughter. It was an adopted child whom he never adopted, and it still turns people's stomachs. So... Uh, Jim, uh, you would think this would get laughed out of court, but who knows what gets laughed out of anything anymore in this culture. And so with uh, this this movement constantly pushing in, in different and more bizarre directions, uh, I, I, I have no confidence in either way how this is going to turn out. Yeah, and let's, let's observe that the need for anonymity in the our third martini kind of further illustrates the need for anonymity in our second martini. <laughs> yes. I don't understand why this couple petitioning for recognition of marriage would be, you know, well, we can't let their identity out. Something bad could happen to them. But let's give it the home addresses of those jurors. Um, so, look, the only thing I'm going to, I, it's very hard to imagine this case going anywhere. It's probably going to get tossed. We're probably going to do just, you know, this will be, you know, uh, if not laughed at a court, hopefully like just tossed and thrown out, like with, with prejudice, with anger, with, you know, um, to quote Samuel Jackson, righteous anger and furious vengeance on this particular uh, suggestion. We're just going to observe that, like, 
you know, listeners of this podcast know I do not particularly get into uh, what people are doing in their bedrooms unless you're the governor of New York and you're haranguing, your, you're harassing your staff, right? You know, basically, you want to go out and marry who you want to marry. I'm very laid back about that sort of thing. I don't like to judge people, all kind of stuff. But it'd be really helpful if once we get to the point, like, you know, two men can marry each other, two women can marry each other. Uh, let's treat, you know, we're all equal in the eyes of the law. Let's all treat each other with respect. And then somebody has to come along and make an argument like this. And they're using the exact same arguments that were made for homosexual marriage. So you go, well, look, love is love. Who are we to judge? Who are we to stand between? Look, (laughs) at some point you got to draw the line. And, you know, this is, you end up like, uh, you know, Patrick Stewart, the line must be drawn here. Yeah, there's a good reason that incest is this giant taboo in every human culture all around the world going back for, for through human history. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, anyway, like, in arguments like this really will do genuine damage to um, gay rights and other movements that are much less controversial and I think are much less, um, much less taboo, much less. Uh, like and this is it was an inter- they're they're vindicating the critics of gay marriage by pointing out that once you allow X, people will make an argument for Y. Well, in this case, they are quite literally arguing for Y and uh, horrifying many people in the process. Well, whether that was the original intent of the Obergfell decision, it is uh, the impetus for where we've gotten in a lot of these things from mandating that curriculum for kids of all ages in schools to you've got to bake the cake, you've got to present the flowers, you've got to take the pictures. And now with the transgender movement and you can't call people by their actual biological pronouns, you have to treat them uh, against biology. And now we're headed in this direction. There's some pushes towards polyamory as well. I mean, uh uh, I guess I guess when you blur the line, uh, people are going to push it in a lot of different directions. And so we'll see what ultimately happens here. But uh, sorry, everybody. I know we didn't really want to go in that direction. But, it's a uh, rebuilding day for the three martini lunch. This we'll, is, we'll have happier topics tomorrow. This is one of those where you're like, you kind of need to know this, but nobody really wants to know it. But uh, let's let's end with our uh, remembrance of Walter Mondale, vice president of the United States for four years, of course, under Jimmy Carter, 1977 to 1981. It just hit me, Jim, that until yesterday, three out of the four candidates on the two major party tickets were still with us from 45 years ago. That is absolutely amazing. Jimmy Carter and Bob Dole still with us. But um, uh, so he was 93. Of course, uh, they, they beat Ford and Dole narrowly in 1976. It was not a good four years for our country economically, uh, national security wise. And that's probably why Reagan and Bush uh, trounced them in 1980, 489 to 49 in the Electoral College. And then Mondale thought it was a good idea to run for president against Reagan four years later. Uh, and he got beat even worse, 525 to 13. He only barely, and by less than 4,000 votes, won his home state of Minnesota and uh, in the District of Columbia. Uh, everybody got a pretty early bedtime that night, which was good for me as a, as a young kid. Uh, and then uh, he was out of uh, electoral politics. I believe he was Clinton's ambassador to Japan for a while. And then in 2002, Senator Paul Wellstone died in a plane crash while running for re-election. And the party uh, put Mondale on the uh, ticket, on the ballot instead of Wellstone. Uh, he got caught up, I would say, more than he was uh, an instigator of the memorial service that turned into a political rally and I think ultimately doomed his effort to win that race. But by losing that race, Walter Mondale, I believe, Jim, has the distinction of being the only person in American history to uh, lose all 50 states uh, in statewide elections. Uh, but the, the moment, of course, we as conservatives will remember was 1984, second debate against President Reagan. It's got a national security focus. Reagan, by his own admission, had not done well in the first debate on domestic issues. And so the question came up at age 73, are you too old for the job? And here was the uh, exchange. You already are the oldest president in history. And some of your staff say you were tired after your most recent encounter with Mr. Mr., uh, Mondale. Um, I recall yet that President Kennedy had to go for days on end with very little sleep during the Cuba Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all, Mr. Truitt, and I, and I want you to know that also I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. And so, Jim, that was pretty much it for that campaign for Walter Mondale, who was 56 at the time. And the thing I love about that clip, in addition to Reagan's awesome line, is that Mondale genuinely enjoyed it. I think I think he even said later that was the moment I knew that I had lost. I, I couldn't come back from that. 
But uh, he didn't try to like think real quick what a, a good rejoinder to that would be or to scowl or anything. He actually kind of appreciated Reagan's uh, uh, approach to that issue. And uh, we probably disagreed with Walter Mondale on just about everything uh, politically. But uh, he, he was a guy, I think, who generally got along with a lot of people. And so uh, a long career for sure. And uh, condolences to his family today. Uh, you, you said almost everything there is to say there, Greg. I'm just going to make the observation that when he did lose Minnesota, I almost wanted him to do like uh, Cal Ripken on the night that he had set the record for most consecutive. <laughs> Just go around and high five everyone for the accomplishment that I don't think we will ever see in our lifetimes, Greg. And you could live to be 150 and you might not see again a single man lose every state in the union. It is, uh, you know, and I say it a little bit tongue in cheek, but I, I'd like actually one genuine observation about that. When you lose a presidential election about as badly as you possibly can, um, then for a lot of men, that would just that would just crush them. That would be, you know, the president, he was vice president. The presidency is what kind of often turns into kind of an all-consuming ambition for, for pig, figures at the highest level of politics. And as I obviously look, this, that hurt. There's no getting around that. But, you know, Walter Mondale then just went on with his life. And I think he set up a, a think tank over at the University of Minnesota and you know, it's kind of, we, we get really wrapped up in the intense stakes of our politics. And it's, you know, look, there are big consequences and all that sort of thing. But, you know, Walter Mondale kind of demonstrates that you can have a really, really, really bad defeat and life goes on and you can still be active in in, uh, in public life and you can still use your, uh, your intellect and your gifts to try to improve public life. Obviously, we disagreed a great deal with his suggestions, but, you know, like he didn't burst into flame. He didn't, you know... Uh, become a hermit and and just disappear. So obviously, he was not going to be the same kind of figure in democratic circles. But I think it's kind of worth remembering every now and then. That this is, you know, the stakes are high. And sometimes in life, so in every race, there's going to be a winner and a loser. And just because you lost a race, it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. It doesn't mean it's the end of your life. Life will go on. So um, that's where we stand to that. Uh, our, our thoughts and prayers are with the Mondale family. And uh, yeah, you know, Probably greatest debate line of all time, arguably. Oh, definitely my favorite. Yeah, yeah. He had a good one in a debate, in a Democratic primary debate. He was one of the candidates to incorporate pop culture because Gary Hart was rambling on about mm. his domestic agenda. And Mondale says, uh, you remind me of that commercial, Where's the Beef? So those of you old enough to remember Clara Peller with the Wendy's Where's the Beef ads from the uh, mid-80s, uh, that was a pretty good line at that time because that, that campaign was really popular. So, uh, Jim, we're old. I think that's the uh, bottom line here. <laughs> When did that happen, Greg? I don't you know, know. It happened on Monday. <laughs> oh, man. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus, Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast. We are very grateful for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Also, remember to get us on those home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. Follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Tuesday. And please join us Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Hey, guys, it's Mock and Daisy from Chicks on the Right. We're excited to tell you about our podcast, the Mock and Daisy Common Sense Cast. From discussing topics like cancel culture, what's happening to our new generations, crises in our nation, and even some high-profile interviews, each week we touch on subjects that matter to us and matter to you. And we're not afraid to tell you how it is. So tune in every week to hear us talk about the things or even just get a good laugh. To find out more, go to our website, chicksontheright.com, or start listening on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Don't forget to leave a comment or review and subscribe.